welcome to Ask the Educator, a podcast brought to you by Healthmark Industries. Are you a sterile processing technician or manager? Maybe you work in infection prevention or biomedical engineering. Whether you're a frontline tech, endoscopy tech, OR nurse, or surgical services administrator, you undoubtedly have influence in medical device processing at your facility. In each episode, we speak with experts from the Healthmark Clinical Affairs team, industry leaders, or special guests from the trenches to answer your questions and bring you relevant industry information, equipping you for excellence in medical device processing. My name is Kevin Anderson, and I will be your host. Now let's get started. Hello, everyone. This is Kevin Anderson, your host for the Ask the Educator podcast. I also have with me our co-host, Adam Okada, and as our guest of honor, uh, Health Mark's very own Jahan Azizi. Uh, Jahan, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Adam. So for this one, Jahan, we were bringing you in because uh, we're going to be talking about conductivity issues. Uh, the, the real issue ends up happening in the operating room, unfortunately, but this is very relevant to the sterile processing uh, industry because this conductivity issue of bipolar or monopolar cautery cords kind of falls in our lap a little bit in sterile processing. And and we're going to kind of address that as we go. But how would you like to kind of maybe introduce this uh, topic and, and to the audience? Like, what are the issues surrounding these bipolar and monopolar cords when we talk about conductivity? Sure. Uh, you know, uh, in order to attach the surgical instrument to the machine, you use obviously a cord, either for bipolar procedures or for monopolar procedures. Uh, we have talked about insulation testing of these, which has been uh, happening a lot more than that. But the conductivity, which is the wire that attaches the uh, connector to the machine or to the instruments, really haven't been taking that much uh, attention for the past uh, several years. And I know uh, being part of the risk management, working with the operating room, uh, there were issues with that. There were uh, patient burned. There were indeed uh, surgical fires, uh, operating room fire that happened. And when did the investigation, we found out that uh, First of all, these cords are not forever cords, so uh, both of them have a specific shelf life, like it's most of them 20 to 25 use or reprocessing. But what happens is that when you use them, even during that 25 times, that since you're pulling on the cord, that as you know, with the monopolar cord, you have what the end of the machine is really heavy. So that kind of gonna add more pressure to those uh, co conductors inside the wire. And then over time, they break. Say, for example, we have 100 conductors in a cord. And then over time, say, 80 of them breaks. Those 20 probably is going to work, give you energy. But if uh, you don't have adequate energy, the surgeon, for example, say that increase the energy by X amount. Now you have a lot more energy coming through, but not enough wires, not enough strand of wire to carry that energy to the instruments. Therefore, you get in that blurb a big zap coming out, smoke and uh, catching the fire either at most, most of the time at the instrument side, at the equipment side, that usually that happens and causes the surgical fire or burn, obviously, you know, if it's near the patient. So there is an issue with that, uh, being able to make sure that the conductivity of those cores are intact. Yeah, and that should get people's attention right away. If we're talking about surgical fires and burns to the patient, I mean, these are serious things that uh, sterile processing really needs to care about. And typically, when we talk about insulation testing or anything like that, and most people think laparoscopics. Oh, yeah, I test my laparoscopics for insulation. That's not the only thing you should be testing. If we look at that amendment, too, from ST79, it does say cords. And not only the insulation testing cords, but conductivity. We need to make sure the cords are actually working the way they're supposed to work. So, uh, John, can you give us some examples of uh, things that have happened from uh, damaged cords and things like that? Sure. Yeah. If you, uh, I, I was, the, the best source is that uh, looking at the FDA 
uh, manufacturer and user facility experience or my database. In that one, actually, I usually see that the tip of the iceberg. We can see that in that if you search for surgical fire or cord, you come up with, I just did one today, and at least I had five hit, five examples that I can bring up. For example, one of them, they said I'm on a polar cord that obviously have additional complaint in the past. Uh, a fire started while the surgeon was using it. The hook was attached to the monopolar cord. The cord frayed near the plastic end, came off, fell into the pocket of the drapes, and started the fire. So this is one example. Another one is that this one, actually, I kind of witnessed that. He said that the surgeon requested that the bovi or the ES2, be turned to 40 watts. That means, obviously, it wasn't getting that the 20 watt or 25 watt. So what it was hoping maybe it wasn't enough energy. But this is that case that I mentioned that enough energy is not going through because you don't have enough conductors on that. At this point, when they increased that to 40, the bowie had completely separated from the remainder of the cord and fell into the operating procedure. So this is what, another example of that. You Some of those strand of wires are breaking, but they're few of them intact, when you increase the energy from 25 to 40 watts, now you're going to see that blip coming up. Another one said that a surgeon was using a bovine monopolar instrument that was attached to a bovine machine with a cable. During the case, the tip, of, the tip end of the cord was attached to a bovine machine, sparked, and the cord broke in two pieces. The second cord was open, obviously, during the procedure and finish the procedure. So if you look at the mod database, you see a lot of example of these that either near misses or somebody cut the issue and move forward. So that's really, as I said, those are the tip of the iceberg. And if you look a little more, if you talk to the operating member staff, you're gonna see that there were some issues that uh, near misses, they cut it before something happened or sometimes they got does the fire and move on with the procedure. And unfortunately, after the case, uh, that becomes history and they don't, they don't report them. But there are a few reports in FDA mod database that people can look and find out see what's going on. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that the mod database is kind of like the tip of the iceberg. And uh, if people aren't reporting things or, or, or you find reports of things in the mod database, you can guarantee basically that that is a very small percentage of what's going on in the real world. All I can tell you is that I've actually lived through one of these. I was working in the operating room during a, a very routine gallbladder removal surgery and working with a physician that I work with all the time. And we do a lot of, lot of gallbladder removal procedures. And I still remember to this day, you know, the lights are off and all of a sudden a huge spark takes place right near the surgeon and the entire cord just severed in half. And it was very scary, to be honest. And the fact that he was able to kind of keep his composure and everyone in the room was able to keep their composure and check for fire and check for injury and all of that was very good. But it was a major near miss. And and to find out later on, you know, that these cords have limited lifespans and all of this stuff and, and that, you know, all of this stuff is known, but not necessarily known by sterile processing professionals that can actually do something about it. You know, Jahan, I, the, the next question really is, Adam talked about the standards and how they've been updated uh, to explain that there is a need that uh, that we look at these cords and inspect them for damage. It's unfortunate, but the standard has been updated, but it's only after all of these reports and all after all of these occurrences have happened. Uh, but what I think it's really important that people understand is what does the manufacturer's IFU say about testing these cords? Because I have a feeling that these IFUs have probably been around a little bit longer than the standards have been updated, correct? So, uh, you know, as a sterile processing professional, we probably should have known about this, you know, before these reports came out. So what does the IFUs say about testing these cords? It was interesting. So when I was looking at some of the IFU, I purchased some brand new cord to see what is inside them. And it was this kind of a booklet 
that you really needed <laughs> magnifying glass to read it. It was like in uh, 27 different languages in a small, really font. So if you magnify that IFU, all of the reusable quotes, so if you have a disposable, obviously that's a different issue. One time use, you pitch it. But all of the reusable quotes, first of all, they have how many times you can use them, mostly 20 or 25 times. So th that's the first thing that uh, you need to identify these cord per manufacturer recommendation that you test them, pitch them, or you throw them away after like 25 use. So that's the first thing. Do you have a system that keeps track of those? Second of all, in addition to that, for example, Curvin or Askelab, it says that after and before each use, you must test the continuity. And in, in particular, I said that you need to use a ohm meter to use the continuity of these cords after and before, which is kind of interesting that how can you test it in the operator? That would be before you use. But in the IFU indicates that you must test these after each processing or use. At least the, uh, you know, the reusable cords, disposable, obviously, hopefully manufacturer did that. Uh, quality control and when you see what it's been tested. But yes, you must test them, but manufacturer recommend, and you correct. So we have the standards, we have the issues with FDA, but at the end of the day, when something happens, manufacturers IFU trumps everything else. So that's the important part that people need to take consideration when you're looking at any devices. One of the things you're talking about, like with the uses and all of these things that are in the IFUs, that's it's so interesting and uh it's one of those things we don't really think about because we do think about again like uh like insulation testing and that kind of stuff but the uses is a huge one that we just we don't have a great way of tracking those things um so that's a, a great point that you brought up and then can you talk a little about the test equipment how do we actually so let's say okay we take this seriously we're going to try to start testing our cords and cables to make sure there's conductivity in them what kind of test equipment do we have available that can do that so for, for biomed tech, obviously every biomed technology, HTM technology, they have a ohm meter, volt meter at their possessions. But uh, obviously those are the one that you want to make sure that you have adequate court, adequate procedure, and then uh, is it zero or 0.4 or, or what have you. So we found out that if biomed was responsible for these courts, they would test them obviously using the ohm meter, and that's the, the manufacturer's recommendation. But uh, we found out at HealthMart that uh, obviously people are not testing them. I haven't seen too many ohm meter in SPD department, but for request of some of our customers, we designed this uh, continuity tester. Basically, is a green for good and no green that the court court knew to be taken uh, take a look at or send back to the man manufacture a pitch or give it to Biomed for additional investigation. And really that's one thing that I, I, I'm hoping that SPD department can use this simple device by just plugging the monopolar cord and the instruments in it. And then you test actually not just the cord, you check the uh, continuity of the instrument as well. So we is a basically uh, a tester that we developed at Health, HealthMark to make life easier for our SPD department. That's excellent, Jahan. And one little detail that I'm going to share that Jahan did not share is that Jahan developed this product uh, in his garage, if I remember correctly. So it was a great contribution by Jahan to both Healthmark, but more importantly, uh, the sterile processing industry at large. Uh, this is something that is a true game changer, a very simple, easy to use test for your cord. Guys, if you have not seen it, it's the Healthmark Continuity Tester. I am a little bit uh, kind of being promotional about this right now, but partly that's just because of the nature of this simple device and the amount of uh, you know risk mitigation involved with this. This is a it's a very easy device to use. Highly recommend it. So please go to hmark.com, reach out to your sales rep, uh, your local Healthmark sales rep. 
ask about this. You won't be uh, mad for reaching out. You will you will be satisfied with this. It's a very simple one, easy to use. And uh, anyway, Jahan, thank you so much for contributing to uh, the product line and to patient safety and also to the podcast. We appreciate you being on here. Look forward to more episodes in the future probably with you. Yeah, as always, it's a great, great pleasure talking to you both. You always go do a great job. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. All opinions expressed on this show are those of the presenters. Before using any medical device, it is important to review the device manufacturer's instructions for use.